Uh, we have uh, something as Christians that a lot of peoples and faiths of the world don't have. Uh, something on a level that so many other faiths don't even come close to. And, and I'm talking about grace. Um, but grace can be difficult to to, to define. And, and the reason why is because we have so many different things that we use it. Uh, to define. For example, uh, if you see a ballerina on a stage, you might say, oh, she dances with such grace. Or if you, you're, you're bowing before your meal, before a family meal, you might say, let's bow together and let's say grace. Uh, or, or maybe if the Queen of England were to visit a country and you would see her uh, maybe bow towards someone who, maybe they were a homeless person, you would say, oh my goodness, she has depicted a, a queen of such grace. But what is it actually when we talk about God's grace? How would we define that? Well, if you look in the old Hebrew language, the, the language of the Old Testament Bible, uh, the word is kanan. Uh, and it means to stoop or to bend down, especially to someone inferior. Um, so if the Queen of England, again, were to bow at a homeless person, someone that normally uh, someone in authority wouldn't bow to, that would be a real mark of Old Testament kanan. Uh, grace. In the New Testament, it's a different word. It's a Greek word, actually, and it's the word charis. We would say in English, charis, the name of my daughter, but charis. It, it's an expression of unmerited favor, and that's the word in the New Testament used for grace. You put both of these together, and you really do get a beautiful definition for biblical grace. Here it is, grace, to stoop down in an effort to provide a practical expression of love towards someone who doesn't deserve it, can't earn it, and can never repay it. And, and this is what Jesus has done for all of us. This is what is at the heart of all of Christianity. We rejected God. We rejected His ways, His plan for man and life. We want to do it our own way. And that, of course, resulted in a broken relationship between us and God. He's the creator of the universe. You break off from that one who is life, who is love, and you get the consequences. Death, separation from God and hell. But God, who is so rich in mercy and grace, demonstrated his love by giving us Jesus. Jesus came to this earth, and he was, for all intents and purposes, the expression of God. And in his love, he took on himself the punishment of our sin. He took on himself the, the death, separation from God in hell so that we wouldn't have to. And instead, he gives us forgiveness. He gives us the possibility of a restored relationship with God. Do we deserve it? No. We can't earn this. We can never repay it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved, through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. This is the message that last week we saw Paul and Barnabas sent out from the church of Antioch to share. The message of the good news of who Jesus is, what he's done for all of us. And they go out and they share. Let's, let's pick back up here. If you would please grab your Bibles, open with me to Acts chapter 15. Acts 15. Paul and Barnabas uh, are incredibly successful as they go out and share on their first mission journey. Uh, many place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, many Jews, but also non-Jews, which would be the predominant populace of the world. Gentile people are placing their faith in Jesus. And so after this very successful mission journey, they return back to the church of, of Antioch. They're celebrating how God has been so good. And, and then the church at Antioch received some visitors, visitors from the church of Jerusalem in Judea. And if you would, please, let's look together at Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, these men are from the church of Jerusalem. We know that because of verse 24. I believe it's 24. Uh, yes, the church of Jerusalem says that we sent those who out, and they ended up disturbing you. And so here's, here are these folks. They've, they've come in, and, and they're saying something very different than the message Paul and Barnabas shared. They're saying, it's yeah, yeah, you have to accept Jesus, but you also have to keep the Old Testament law. And confusion begins. They're saying, yes, it's Jesus, but you also have to be circumcised. That's what the law prescribes. And Paul and Barnabas' message was about grace. 
It was a gift that God gives. Uh, it's not keeping all of God's rules. And they said, hey, you can't earn this. You, you, can't, you can't repay it. Salvation is a gift from God that must be accepted, received through faith. And so this really begs a significant question that's been with us for a long time. How is a person made right with God? How is a person made right with God? Paul and Barnabas would say, it's grace. By God's grace, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And these folks would say, no, 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 no. It's Jesus and obedience to the Old Testament law, which, by the way, includes circumcision and 612 other requirements. Look at verse 2. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about the question. So they make their way to Jerusalem to talk to the church leaders, verse 4 and 5. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers, some of the believers, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. And how is a person made right with God. One group says one thing, another group says another. And it's been 2,000 years since that meeting, close to it anyway, and, and we're still, this question still finds its way into our faith. People want to know, how are we made right with God? Paul deals with this for most of his ministry. This question keeps coming up again. Even though the church, they settle the matter, it still keeps coming up. In fact, Paul writes the church of Galatia, and he, he shares some interesting words. Look with me uh, in uh, Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And, and Paul is saying, hey, we used to be slaves to sin, but, but we have been freed through what Jesus Christ did for us. We, by grace, have been set free. Don't allow yourselves to be slaves anymore. And a few verses later, he says in verse 7 and 8, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And he uses even some harsher language earlier in the book, uh, in chapter 3. And this is the New Living Translation. Follow along with this. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made, has, was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? And the answer, of course, is no. No, we are saved by grace. The grace of God. It's all Jesus and what he did, his work, not our work. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. And we can never repay it. It's the work of Jesus. But back to Acts chapter 15. Uh, here they are. They join with the church leaders and the councils in progress. Look verse 6 and 7 with me. The apostles and elders met to consider the question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Peter, brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. And so Peter stands up and basically says, guys, God has already called this. And he continues, look at verse 8 and 9. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them. Just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them. And uh, for he, he, per, he purified their hearts by faith. He's saying, hey, we were given the law. Uh, the Gentiles weren't. It was us Israelites. And God made it no distinction when he gave the Holy Spirit. He gave it to the Gentiles just like he gave it to us. And, and, and how did we receive all this? Was it faith or was it by works of the law? And, of course, we see verse 9 is through faith. Through faith. 
It's God's work of grace. Look at verse 10 and 12. This, this is so important. Acts 15 is a, is a passage that all Christians should know about. It really is, just like John 3.16. We should know Acts 15 because it's a hallmark of our faith that grace has been given so that we don't earn our salvation like all the other faiths of the world. Um, uh, verse 10 through 12. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And again, it's grace, grace, God's grace. Uh, Dr. Tim Cox, a friend of mine back in Ohio, he uses a football analogy I really like a lot with this whole context here. He says that uh, uh, God called the play, chapter 10, when Peter received the vision of the blanket with all the unclean animals. Peter threw the play, chapter 10. Peter goes and talks to Cornelius, his friends and family, and they all become Christians. Cornelius and his friends and family receive the play because they receive salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and all of this happened how? By grace. By God's good grace. And Peter says, upon further review, the play stands as called. And Peter and Barnabas stand up and they begin to declare everything that God did. And everywhere we went, we ran this play and this play works. And you know what? It's called the grace play. And we've been using it ever since. And it still works with you, with me today. Then James, Jesus' half-brother, is now a leader in the church of Jerusalem. He stands up. Look with me, verse 13 through 19. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by t taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The works of the prophets are in agreement with us. As it is written, and he begins to quote Old Testament prophets. After this, I will return and build David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things that have been known for ages. Verse 19, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And so they all agree, and they write a letter. Now, this is a lengthy, but it's very important that we get this. Look at verse 30 through 32. They write this letter, and they send it out. The men were sent out, went down to Antioch. They were gathered, where they gathered the church together, delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging words, its encouraging message. So, where the men of Jerusalem came up to Antioch, and they began to share a message that, that confused and enslaved people. you got to keep the law. Now the church of Jerusalem is sending a new group of people out, and uh, they arrive, and they're strengthening, and they're encouraging the people. And so how is a person made right with God? The answer is grace through faith in Jesus Christ. His life, His death, His resurrection for all of us. And guys, this is huge. This is, I, I hope you're, you grasp the hugeness of this because it's not only how we're made right with God, it differentiates Christian with all the other faiths of the world. All the other faiths of the world uh, say you have to earn your way to God. Except Christianity. It's a gift from God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But more than that, it helps us understand questions that crop up from time to time. Like, for example, how are we supposed to engage our culture? Are we supposed to tell them, do this, 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 and this, and then you'll be accepted in God's kingdom? No, no, no. It's by grace. We, we see here, James said, don't make it difficult. It's grace. It's a gift. Um, number two, who can get in on all this? Do you, have to, do you have to become a Jew? Uh, do you have to be a convert to Judaism and start obeying the law? No, 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 no. This is for everybody, Jew, non-Jew. Anyone willing to trust in Jesus, who he is, what he's done, 
It doesn't matter what, how long your hair is. It doesn't matter what kind of clothes you wear. It doesn't matter. It all, what matters is are you trusting and putting your faith in Jesus and who he is and what he's done. I've had so many people over the years, and maybe you've had this too, where they say, you know, I, I want to, to get right with God, but there are a few things I need to take care of first. There are a few things I need to clean up in my life. And, and you know, on some level we can respect that, but the truthful answer is no. There's nothing you have to do right now to receive and accept what God's done for you. The, just the way we are. God wants to save us and, and cleanse us and forgive us and bring us into his family and gift us with his Holy Spirit as well as gifts so that we can be used. Let God do the changing. We don't want to make it difficult for people to know God. When the Apostle John wrote about the arrival of Jesus to earth, he says in John chapter 1, verse 14, that Jesus came full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. You could say the Old Testament is God's truth. Do this or die. Do this or I will judge you. And then Jesus comes and he brings the truth, but he brings grace as well. And that's how we're saved, by grace through faith. And when we are following after Jesus, our rabbi, our teacher, Remember, following after a rabbi in Jesus' day, it meant be like the rabbi. You want to become like him. So as, as followers of Jesus, as we follow him, become like him, then we should be people of grace and truth. Not just grace, not just truth, grace and truth. And when we are people of grace and truth, it means, number one, we learn from our mistakes. I learn from my mistakes. That's so important. Um, God says in 2 Corinthians, my power is made perfect in weakness. We live in a world, don't we, that says hide your mistakes, hide your imperfections, your weaknesses. Don't tell anybody about them, you know. But a, a life of truth and grace means that we're not only aware of them, but we use them to motivate us to draw near to God because in him we can find healing power. We can find strength to overcome weakness. It's his grace. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Draw near to him, his truth, his grace. That's where we find forgiveness and strength to overcome those weaknesses. Living a life of truth and grace also means I respond wisely. Wisely. We could just respond in truth, not truth and grace, just truth, uh, uh, which can be harsh. You ever have somebody in your life that's really good at telling you the truth without the grace? Yeah. Uh, but... You know, we're to respond wisely, which means truth and grace. I heard a, this past week about two neighbors, and they, uh, they have political signs that oppose each other. One had Biden signs, one had Trump signs. Now, you would think that they hated each other, right? Especially during this season. You'd think that my wife and I go on walks, and I'm just going to be completely honest. I'm walking down the road, her and I, and we look over, and we see signs of a person we're not going to vote for, and what do I say? I don't like those people. I'm tempted to say and think that. They have that sign. They obviously are somebody I don't like. Vernon, you're a pastor. But that's the reality. That's what, that's what first comes up. And then I realize, ho, 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 that's not grace and truth, is it? Not at all. This, this, these, these neighbors I heard about, they, Biden signs, Trump signs, you'd think they hate each other, but you know what? They cut each other's grass, have to take the signs out and then put them back. <laughs> they, they, if they have leftovers or extra food, they sometimes share it. They watch each other as kids. They love each other. That's truth and grace. And, you know, it, it allows discourse where we can talk out why we live in a culture that won't even allow us to talk. It, it, there's something in our culture that's divided us so to such extremes that we can't even dialogue anymore. What's gone on? We have to be able, if we're going to be seekers of truth, we have to come together in grace and learn and understand, hey, I'll be the first to, to admit I'm not right about everything. <laughs> that's my wife. She'll tell you. I am not right about everything. There are things I can learn and the best way to do that is when we come to the table in truth and grace. We talk and listen and learn. 
God gives us truth and grace, and he calls us to truth and grace. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 says, be wise with outsiders. This is talking about people who aren't in our faith. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Christians should be known for their love and their truth, their grace. We have to respond wisely. But there's something else that uh, when, you're, when you're living a life of, of grace and truth, it means number three, your life can count. Your life can count. Galatians 5 and 6 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Remember the definition of grace that we looked at earlier? Let's read it one more time. Grace, to stoop down in an effort to provide a practical expression of love towards someone who doesn't deserve it, can't earn it, and could never repay it. I don't know about you, but I have some room to grow when it comes to grace. God has given it to me. I need to give it to others. Most of you have heard of Pro Football Hall of Famer Coach Tom Landry. He was the original coach for the Dallas Cowboys and was coached for years. When he was 33 years old, he committed his life to Jesus. And he made his life about serving Jesus, even above football. He exhibited a life of truth and grace. One example was uh, back in 1978, Ohio State went to the Gator Bowl. Uh, some of you might remember Woody Hayes. At that particular game, Woody, the ball was intercepted by the opposing team. The uh, interceptor fell at the feet, and Woody was right there. He grabbed him as he stood up, grabbed him by the collar, and punched him right in the neck. The coach punched the opposing player. Punched him. Then grabbed a hold of his mask, and then a huge brawl ensued right there on the field. All because he was upset. He was mad. Now, now Woody Hayes was known for being fiery. He was known for offending people, but that crossed the line. 24 hours later, he was fired, never to be rehired again. And boy, did people jump on the bandwagon and spew toward him. Reporters piled on. He was humiliated mercilessly. He withdrew to his home in shame. Meanwhile, Coach Landry just had another fantastic season. Previous season, his team, Cowboys, went all the way to the Super Bowl. This time, he led them to the NFC Championship. He was on the top, the mo one of the most beloved coaches in the country. He was invited to a prestigious event in New York City. He could only bring one person. Normally, you'd bring your wife. Everybody expected it. That's what everybody does, but not him. Tom Landry shows up with the shamed Woody Hayes. And people's mouths went like this. Later on, somebody asked him, who served on the board of Dallas Theological Seminary with Tom, why did you do that? He said, I figured that since everybody else was beating up on him, he needed somebody to put their arm around him and tell him they still loved him. Did Woody Hayes deserve that? Did he earn it? It's called grace. To stoop down in an effort to provide a practical expression of love towards someone who doesn't deserve it, can't earn it, can never repay it. Grace changes things. It's changed you, hasn't it? It changes people. Chuck Swindoll writes, love that reaches up is adoration. Love that reaches out is compassion. Love that reaches down is grace. All of us are going to come across people in our lives, people who have been shamed, people who might have done something horribly wrong. I remember a local pastor in Ohio who um, had an affair with somebody in the church, a married woman. Of course, he was fired immediately. It was the talk of the town. I ran into him at a Chick-fil-A a month and so later. Our eyes met, and he kind of looked down in a way. And I didn't know what to do. So I went up to him and just gave him a big hug. 
I said, I know things are tough for you. I just want you to know I love you. I don't know about you, but if I was in a bad situation where I'd done something really stupid, I would need people to do that to me. Especially as a follower of Jesus who really messed up. We need to be people of grace, truth, and grace. We're going to meet them. They're going to come all our, our way. And people are going to be shamed and silent. They'll be withdrawn. And we're going to have opportunities where we can stoop down and pick them up and embrace them like Jesus did us. Where we can demonstrate to others what he demonstrated to us. Grace. And when we do, when we do, we continue what Jesus started. He came full of grace and truth. And it's the way we're to live as well. Let's bow together. Father, we don't deserve it. We can't earn it. We'll never be able to repay you, Lord, for your expression of love. The grace in sending us Jesus. Lord, maybe someone here is trying to earn it. Lord, may they just say yes to your grace today. Some people, Lord, think they have to pay for it. May they just say yes to your grace. And Lord, as you have given us your grace, you call us to minister in grace. This week, Lord, help us to love those who are different, who see things differently. Help us, Lord, to stoop down, pick somebody up if needed, embrace them and show them your grace. And as a church family, Lord, help us to never make it difficult for someone who desires to turn to Jesus. With every head bowed, if you're here, you're listening or you're here, and you're realizing you need to open your heart and receive the grace of God, would you do so now? If you're ready, just, just talk to him. Just say, Jesus, forgive me. I know I've blown it. I've messed up so many times try to do life on my terms and I've just messed it up forgive me I believe who Jesus is I believe he died for me on the cross I believe he rose from the dead for me he took on the punishment of my sin so I wouldn't have to I accept it I accept your grace I accept your forgiveness and I want to follow you this day forward, help me to follow you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray.